Welcome to the Recovery and Company podcast, featuring addiction and recovery experts with the latest recovery news, treatment options, therapeutic techniques, causes of addiction, and stories of hope and healing from those in recovery. Welcome to the Recovery and Company podcast. I'm Jody Stevens. I'm talking with Cody Croxon. Uh, did I say your last name right? You did. Yes, you did. My understanding is you are in recovery from opiate, which includes fentanyl. Cody, mm-hmm. congratulations on your recovery, first of all. And thank, thank you, you so much for agreeing to come on and talk with us. Yeah, no, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. And uh, again, I, I'm so, so happy to be here and have this chance to, to hopefully share my life story. And uh, maybe we're, we're, our goal is to impact and help motivate others to, to get through their challenges that they're, they're given with this and uh, hopefully help, you know, educate and, and keep people away from it as well. Absolutely. So thank you Absolutely. so much. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, and that is totally the goal. What's cool is you're actually in Reno. You actually could have come over to my studio and done this, which is uh, sweet because a lot of times I'm dealing with time changes. And mm-hmm. yesterday our interview guy was from Louisiana, you know, and oh, so wow. we're dealing with a time change. So it's kind of cool. So yeah. you're in Reno. So like you're yeah. probably, I'm in Sun Valley. So you're probably like just across town. Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> I'm not far from you at all. <laughs> so okay. cool. I, yeah. So Cody, what do you do? Like, could you tell me a little quick, little bit about yourself? Because our mm-hmm. lives are not about, you know, our recovery, makeup, our life, but there's so much more than that, you know? Of course. Yeah. So um, I'm 32 years old. So I'll be 33 in March. And uh, right now I currently work at Charles River Laboratory. So, and uh, I've been there for, it's going to be nine years almost in February. And I work in management there. So I I managed to find my way, start at the the very bottom of the totem pole with the company and managed to climb up into a spot right now. Um, And it's going well. I actually am trying to transition into firefighting. Um, That's been my lifelong dream. Um, Always a really had interest in that and wanting to help people through that. Um, you know, the EMT sides of things, the medical calls that you go on, all that fun stuff. So I was actually just in Sacramento yesterday taking a physical uh, to clear everything for that. So hopefully that's the next new chapter of my life. I'll find out here real soon um, when interviews come. It should be within the next month. And then they start their academy in February and, and I'm hoping to be part of that. So, but um, yeah, that's a, that's a little bit of what I do right now. I, I'm very involved in fitness and health. Um, and we'll touch on that as far as that is my biggest crutch and support um, for me to relieve everything. It's my therapy outside of therapy um, that really has helps motivate me doing everything that I can, makes me happy, feel confident, um, and overall just good in every aspect. Um, I, I'm very, I'm very outdoorsy. I hunt and fish. I, I grew up, I was born and raised with a family who was into outdoors, every bit of physical activity we can. Um, so that's part of my life always will be. And I played sports growing up. So I went to college for a little bit to play baseball. Um, not too long, but I came back and, and then got on with my life and just working and, and here we are now. So it that's starts awesome. to move quick. <laughs> That's so great. And you know, your age, I'm, I'm quite a bit older. I've been sober 17 years, but I was around your, I was around your age when I got sober. So was my husband. So I think it's, it's kind of at that cool age, you know, early thirties where a lot of times we're like, wait a minute, man, this isn't working. (laughs) I got to try something else, you know, with my life and stuff. So that's, that's a great story. You know, you're, you're right there. And that's kind of the age too, where we could, we could skate, like we, we get away without losing all of our faculties, you know, because you look good, you know, you're not, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) So that's good. Um, I love it. I was in, I did radio 30 years. So I was in Sacramento. I did a morning show there. Uh, or yeah. And so that's cool. And then, uh, the outdoor stuff, I'm with you. That's such a lifesaver. I grew up in Alaska. So all the whole outdoor stuff. Yeah. (laughs) That's so awesome. It's Love it. on my bucket list. Oh, <laughs> Got to yeah. make my way there. Yeah, you'll totally have to go there. I don't know if you're a mm-hmm. skier, but it's a great place mm-hmm. to ski. Snowboard, but yeah, very, yep, yeah, <laughs> very yep. much. And, and of course, all the, the hunting. Like I went to mm-hmm. college in Fairbanks and oh, a lot of hunting and fishing, you know, oh. ate grizzly bear and yeah, lots yeah. of caribou and, you know, all oh, that yeah. stuff. Oh, it's so cool 
cabin so with neat. no running water and then I went to California and you know, <laughs> all that changed, you know. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, anyway, so Cody, tell me a little bit about your story of um, addiction and recovery. You know how yeah. they say like in meetings, where were you before? Mm-hmm. What happened? And where yeah. are you now, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, we'll try and make it so it's not, it doesn't take up like an hour for me to say I it know, all. I know, I <laughs> know. But... Our stories are involved. Give me the highlights, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. Of course. So um, let's see. I first, let's see. I was about, I, I was really good through high school. Um, mm-hmm. I barely drank at all. Um, I stayed really concentrated in sports. I was really afraid to get in trouble. Um, I was actually, my dad is a retired uh, police officer. So I, I feel I, I had very strict parents growing up and which is a great thing. Um, and I first started, the first thing I ever touched was marijuana. Um, and I fell in love with that actually when I did. <laughs> and I was probably about the age of 20. Um, I think it was 19 when I first did actually smoke and try it. Um, and then realized, Hey, this is great. I thought it was something that was amazing and better than alcohol. And, you know, uh, kind of got caught into that and it, it turned into, uh, an everyday thing. And I, I think then was when I realized that, and I had had, like, I used to chew actually to, uh, nicotine. So, um, and my father, he, he chews nicotine and he's, that's always been his biggest challenge is to, to quit the tobacco use. Um, and very hard. So I have some of it in my blood. Um, I recognize that my mom's, uh, has a brother who's had very troubled past with things too. Um, but the, the marijuana use actually led into something called, I believe you've heard of it, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, um, CHS. And it's actually very, it causes it, crazy it just it wreaks havoc on the digestive tract and i started getting really sick Mm -hmm. um extremely sick actually had to go in the hospital quite a few times and it took a while uh, with how how available and um, legal marijuana is now they're finding this stuff out a lot more um so Mm -hmm. but that's just a brief little history of when i started realizing that i probably do have an addictive personality um it was a little hard to get away from it but with me being as sick as i was i completely stopped cold turkey and it cured up all my problems um so i was vomiting every morning losing weight it took about two years to figure this stuff out went through every test so anyways um it was about the age of 25 after that and i had uh moved in I had just split up with a girlfriend and I had a really good friend of mine and his wife. Um, they threw the off for me and said, Hey, you know, we know you just, you're going through a hard time right now. We'd love to help you get back on your feet. Um, and I was living with her at the time. So he said, you're more than welcome to stay with us as long as you need um, and get yourself back together. We are the one person that we would love to have stay with us. Um, and unfortunately at that time though, I, I had, that was when I first experimented with opiates. Um, mm-hmm. and he, you know, he, he still beats himself up to this day. And I tell him, you need to, you need to forgive yourself and let go of that because I made my own decisions. Um, but that was how I got introduced into it. The first time I ever tried opiates and I had no clue, um, what they were really besides surgeries, my past surgeries. And yeah. my mom was, you know, get, was the one who always gave me the medication. And um, so I never had that. I never felt the effects of that euphoric high that you get from them um, until I tried it with him. And what it was, was it was, I believe there were 10 milligram uh, oxycodones and there was no acetaminophen in them. And so you were able to actually, what we did was we crushed them up and we snorted them. Um, and that was where my life started turning into a whole different path at that point. It went for a while. I still didn't ever, I didn't get caught into it for a bit until there was one day in life. I managed to be in a really vulnerable spot. I was in my, I was in a new relationship. Um, and unfortunately the relationship I in had some past history that actually caused some really bad family hit problems with me. Um, brother and I ended up not getting along. Actually, we, we went for about a year without speaking. I have an older brother and we're about two years apart. So we're pretty close in age. Um, and it, it really led into a spot, a very dark moment with me where I just want, I wanted to numb everything going on in my life. 
Um, I, I wasn't happy. Um, I had started using marijuana again, actually, and started getting sick again. And when I tried opiates, it was something that numbed my body and it numbed everything. So that led into me spiraling downhill into uh, the next about three years of my life um, where I was using and it just kept getting worse. Um, I'll never forget when I got our, uh, our drug dealers contact information and my buddy specifically said, be careful with this. And I thought at that time, you know, I'm, I'm very strong and will powered and, you know, nothing I, I have control. Um, right. And, and yeah, like we all think, I think a lot of the time, you know, I know, and, I know uh-huh. that's, that's such, <laughs> the, such the root of the addiction is yeah. this, this control of mm-hmm. wanting to, you know, control people, places and things yeah. and, and, yep. meant, and our anxiety and all these sorts of things mm-hmm. drive it, and fuel it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and I didn't recognize these things either until yeah. you know, now, obviously I, I've taken a very long time to really figure all this stuff out. And, um, so yeah, it was, I actually remember realizing that I started getting withdrawals at one point when I was like, Oh God, I'm got first for the first thing I was doing was l- losing all my money. So every dollar, every extra penny I had, I was putting into to my addiction. And that was when I first, I'll, I, I will never forget this day. I bought a new car. Um, it was a Jeep and I, <laughs> I ended up having the first registration for it that I'd ever had to pay. So the year was up, registration's due, and it caught me off guard by it being $500. And at that moment, I realized, wow, I am not able to pay for my car registration right now, or it's going to take every dollar I have. And now I've got to get through the next week or however long it was until I got paid um, to figure things out. And that's when I realized first, like, I've I've got a problem. You know, this is something I need to fix. Um and it didn't really know how bad withdrawals were going to be or anything like that. And, and go back, I, I felt them a little bit at one point. So there was about a two week to a month period where I did stop using. Um, and it was early enough in to where it wasn't too bad. Um, I felt those withdrawals and realized, oh, and then it messed up sleep for a bit, but I somehow fell back into it. Um, mm-hmm. And so this was about, like I said, we're going on about three years in right there. And that was when I finally first quit opiates. Um, and that was hard. That was very hard. And I still, you know, for, for where I'm at now, I, and it took me, I couldn't believe that I was actually, I actually relapsed, but anyways, so got through it and I stayed clean for a while, actually. Um, not long though. It was probably, I'd say maybe six to eight months. Um, and I had been doing great. I started lifting again and staying in shape and all of a sudden I, I, I had a co actually, no, I had, uh, my girlfriend at the time, her dad, um, was prescribed painkillers regularly because he has serious back problems and histories Mm -hmm. had motorcycle accidents, all this stuff that, that he was prescribed daily. But, um, the addict's mind that I had. I was able to go in and figure out how much she was taking and sneak bits and here and there. And that's when I started going back downhill, Mm -hmm. um, little bits here and there. It was never to the point where I was going back to my drug dealer that I had. I tried at times, um, couldn't, couldn't get through. Thank God that she was terrible (laughs) with, with dealing and I I couldn't get a hold of her a lot of times. So luckily Uh that really kept me away from the 30 milligram, they call them perk thirties now. I'm sure you've heard that. And, uh, but that's a, yeah, it's a 30 milligram concentrated oxycodone tablet or, or hydrocodone. Um, and again, people will, will snort those, they'll smoke them. They can, they'll do other stuff, break them down to where they can inject it. Um, and so, Went for about a year, I'd say, um, sneaking painkillers. And, and I've always been a very honest person. Um, and to me, stealing is like t- a terrible thing. I always never, like it just, it's always disgusted me, um, especially mm-hmm. taking from someone's personal belongings or their hard work or hard money. So it took yeah. me a bit to really forgive myself on that um, because I realized that what I was doing, but it was about a year of doing that. Um, and what that was doing was it was just building up, building up until we relapsed hard. Um, so I got out, started, 
started cleaning my act up again, realizing that I'm falling off track. I'm starting to really get addicted again. Tried to clean things up and did for a bit. Um, and then at that point, you know, I, I started doing well, I stopped it's, let's go. So I'm about 30 years old at this point. And I started getting, I went to school. I wanted to be a firefighter. always have, um, I knew in order to do that, I've got to become an EMT. So I went to school, um, within a six month period, I'm sorry, eight month period. I got my EMT basic and I did a rapid course for my advanced EMT. So I got through those. And, um, unfortunately I had some skin cancer, uh, surgeries. So I realized, yeah, I'm, I'm vulnerable to the sun. Gotta be careful with this, uh, yeah. for the rest of my life. But, um, at this time I had some surgeries and was prescribed painkillers again. Oh gosh. So, um, yes. And I realized, all right, my pain's not so bad that I actually need these. What I'll do is I'll, I'll hold on to as much as I can and, Take the amounts to get the euphoric high out of it. And from that moment on, it triggered it again. So uh, we go for about a good year, I'd say almost, where I had another, I had a, an employee that I managed to twist my stories up and, and you know, beg him for painkillers whenever if he had extras because he always needed it for his uh, health issues he had going on. Um, and kept, you know, sneaking little bits here and there from him. And this was about a year of it building up. And I did really well throughout most of this year too, actually. Um, I started competing in the gym or powerlifting, started becoming really good at it. So when I was really focusing on that, I was pretty clean and I wasn't touching things. And then I'd get through something and I felt like I needed this, you know, uh, vacation in my own mind you know i've got work stressing me out i just worked my ass off in this competition and and i'm gonna you know i want i want something to relax and i felt right. like i was strong enough to relax for a week and then get back to life um and that's when i found out the hard way so we'll speed up and do like that was about it you know a while that carrying on like that so i'm 31 right now and I ran into, um, I had been pretty clean, just that look, like I said, but I still was dabbling, getting what, whatever I could really get my hands on at that point. Um, and it, it triggered it to where I was started feeding it. You know, I, I really started craving this. Um, I was going through a lot at, at work. Um, there was some stressors I was dealing with. I had a team lead of mine, or a, sorry, a, my most senior employee um, actually ended up taking his own life. Um, so I was kind of dealing with some things that I, mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, I hadn't gone through the right therapy during all this, like, which I should have <laughs> for, for all a while now. Um, I didn't know how to cope with things very well. Uh, so I ended up running into an old coworker of mine at the store. And I'll never forget this day because it was the turning point where I introduced myself into fentanyl. And I had been craving that. I had been doing great. And I could see it in his eyes. I could see in his eyes that he was clearly on some sort of opiates. Um, and I kept sitting on this. I'm like, you know, I, I can't, I knew that there was this, there was the risk of me really relapsing. And I thought that I was going to be strong enough for that not to happen. So I ended up asking him for some, like, you know, we exchanged numbers then just to, to hang out at one point. Mm -hmm. Well, I ended up using that to dig in and, see if he had you know connections for painkillers and ended up finding out that he did but the painkillers that he had were fentanyl um and not recognizing that he's a big fentanyl dealer this is what he does um so he actually tried he actually really tried not to give them to me for a bit he was worried that you know how strong this stuff is it's mm -hmm. taking people's lives every hour of the day um and he figured that that he didn't want me to be one of those uh, but I kept telling him, I said, no, I'm strong enough. Don't worry. That's not going to happen to me. Uh, so let's see. This is last year in December, November, December of 2021. So and let me just, let me just interject and ask you, is mm -hmm. this, you know, we do this with other drugs. Is this what's happening with people in fentanyl now where they're, they're, they're watching people die, mm -hmm. but they're saying to themselves, it won't happen to me. 
exactly. These people just yeah. don't have a tolerance or something. Is that what people are telling themselves? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, I guarantee okay. that, you know, you feel a lot of us, you know, depending on where we're at or no matter anything, you feel like you're, you have control over yourself. Mm -hmm. You have control of what you're putting in your body. So in my mind, I was like, I'm not going to take enough to make that happen. You know, I'm going to really make sure that. Even though it's like and, two and grains of salt, you know. Exactly. I mean, yes. And wow. that's what's so scary about fentanyl is you don't know how much you're getting. You don't know how okay. much you're taking. And especially with what I was taking were those perk 30s and they were laced with fentanyl. And I could see it too. You could see different colors to them. You could see different certain ones tasted, you know, because the like again, like I said, I was going intranasally, so I was, I was snorting them, um, and you could almost taste the difference of the strengths mm -hmm. and stuff. So exactly, you know, people are saying that's not going to be me. I'm not going to be part of the statistics, you know, not knowing that you don't really have control over that if you're risking what you're doing. So, yeah. because like you said, two, two grains of salt of fentanyl is going to knock down your largest person. Um, so it was these, this was the darkest days of my life. Um, it was about seven. It took me about seven weeks for, from the time that I had first tried it until I was in detox so about wow. almost two months. So really quick, thank God, you know, um, but that's how strong it was. It took me from one week to first I was buying one little pill, then it was two little pills. Um, and then within two to three weeks, I was buying bagfuls of it, spending $400 at a time, getting 20 pills at once. And I mean, these, you know, that, that 20 pills of laced fentanyl can wipe out a large, large group of people. And I ended up getting the point tolerance. And that's the scary thing about fentanyl is it, it really is so fast acting that mm -hmm. it hits you really quick. Um, and your tolerance starts climbing really quick too. So my tolerance had shot up so fast. And before I knew it, two weeks go by or anything. And then I'm, I'm going through withdrawals. You know, if I go four hours without touching it, I'm going, I'm starting withdrawals. And that's what I couldn't believe was how fast withdrawals would start if you, if I didn't use. So it ended up being something that I had to use regularly throughout the day. So I was trying to work, um, work was crazy. I was actually trying to get on with firefighting at this time. So I'm going through interviews, um, getting as close as I could be possibly be to my dream job and knowing that I'm. I'm screwed right now. I, I kept trying to ask myself, what am I going to do right now? How am I going to get out of this? Cause I realized that I can't get out of this without withdrawals. I thought I, the whole time I started that, I thought I was only going to do it for a week and then I was going to stop. And then I wasn't going to have withdrawals mm -hmm. and it didn't work that way. Life kept going on and I had to take care of life. And in order for me to function and take care of life, I couldn't go through withdrawals. So I kept using and it turned into me waking up and using throughout the middle of the night. So during this time, within seven weeks, there were three, three at least occurrences where I had overdosed. Um, one time, the first time, which actually was the second, which scared the living hell out of me, um, was when I realized that like this, I am, I need to stop this or I'm either going to lose everything I have or I'm going to die. Yeah. And there's, there's, there are two routes right there. And to me, it was, it was going to be death because I, you're, you're playing with, you're playing with fire. You're on the edge right there. So close to death because you're putting this in your body, not knowing how much you're putting in. All it takes is just a tiny little minute amount over what you do and you're over. And so I was in my bathroom one night and I was using it and I ended up passing out standing. So I had my mirror in front of me and I think the only thing that really kept me alive was the fact that I was still standing. Um, cause I think that was just enough for my body to my heart to keep pumping for me to keep breathing, you know, cause your respiration system is what completely yeah. shuts down, you know, that, mm -hmm. and, um, I don't know how long I was there, but it was long enough that the oils on my face were all over the mirror. You could see how it's kept like dragging down the mirror from me falling down. Um, and it was long enough to where I 
couldn't comprehend time after I couldn't think straight. I went into an immediate, immediate panic attack. And it's about three o'clock in the morning. And I realized I need to be at work at, at seven o'clock. Um, but I also couldn't get time down. I, I, it just, it was, I was down long enough to where I don't know if the lack of oxygen or, or what it did, but I thought that I was never going to be the same after this point. I thought that I really ruined myself. Um, so I went into a panic attack. Luckily I jumped in the shower, got things wrong. I was able to get back on my feet. But, uh, so that was the first moment where I realized that I've got to fix this. And I didn't really know how though, you know, I knew my family, um, they had known that I, I had used before and I got through it. So this whole time for, you know, two years or so, my family thought I had been clean and I was hiding this evil side of me, you know, mm -hmm. by just getting away and, and hiding it. And here we come up to Christmas. So I'm over with Christmas and, you know, things are going great, but my parents can tell something's off. Um, and I'll never forget when I walked, it was later at night, uh, my dad, my brother. So my brother was, has been working out of town this time. So whole family's there. So they were, they were up having a drink and, you know, just talking and it's about 1130 at night. And I had been, I'd went to bed. I was tired because I was also tired every minute of the day with being high, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, under the influence of fentanyl. And I walked out without my shirt on. Um, to get some water and they were in the kitchen still. And I'll never forget at that point, I, my skin actually started showing signs and stuff. I started getting the sores and lesions and, you know, on the body. And, and I'll never forget when my dad and brother saw that. And I, I remember them looking at each other and they, they're something's up then. And I'll never mm -hmm. forget that moment. I realized my family knows something's going on, yeah. you know, and yeah. So I ended up, I'm trying, sorry, I know this is a long, long story here, um, but uh, I ended up going. So throughout this time, I had used again and I ended up slightly overdosing in the bathroom again. Oh, um, and I had stumbled over the toilet once I had woken back up and fell into a glass vase that they had for display and shattered it and everything. This is six o'clock in the morning. So mm -hmm. my dad came running in and I tried to tell them that I dropped my phone and tried to catch it and did that. So they knew something was up. My family was, they were afraid to say something at this point a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now they've recognized that they will always keep a tight leash on me. Um, they will always pay attention to these signs and never hold their breath or bite their tongue mm -hmm. if they're worried about something, um, yeah. you know, and they're never going to have to worry about that again. You know, I very, <laughs> they so anyways uh my mom was it's so weird how i feel like there's like you always have these stories where like something happens and someone if someone says i was so scared that that was going to happen or, like this mm -hmm. is so my mom had this weird feeling and i almost so i'm going home um driving back to my place they live about 30 minutes out of town and i almost rolled my car this oh, wow. i had started falling asleep at the wheel and i had been in the left lane and when I had come to, I corrected and my car, I completely shifted sideways or corrected the right car rolled up on two wheel on, on its side on two wheels. And thank God, you know, and I just, I was able to get it back on the ground. And so I pulled off the side. This is when I started trying to stop. So I realized that like, I'm going to die. And I have a family who loves me. I have friends who love me. I have so much going on in my life and I'm going to, I'm going to throw it all away. And so at that time I'd ended up getting COVID. So this is, everything was a blessing the way it started working out in time. So I got COVID, which at this time had to keep me away from work. So two mm -hmm. weeks. Um, and I, at that, so I thought in my head, all right, I've got two weeks right now that I've got, away from work. I'm still going to work from home, but I need to stop. I need to get off of this stuff yeah. and not understanding how strong fentanyl really is. And I couldn't stop them out. So, cause again, it was every four hours, four mm -hmm. hours of hit. I was trying to go, I cut back from 30 or from, sorry, five pills a day and really started to cut back quick. So it's just as much as I could. I started grinding out for two weeks. I was going through withdrawals because I was making that I was getting the point of where the withdrawals were so much. I couldn't take any more than I'd have to use a little bit, you know? And at that point too, what people don't understand is you're risking your tolerance is starting to drop in. 
you're still using a little bit about all it takes is for you to use just too much at that time to stop withdrawals and you overdose again. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. so I had a friend, um, who I hadn't seen for four years and we were supposed to see each other and I was going through withdrawals and I said, Hey, I'm so sorry. I'm really not feeling well. Um, I, so this one wasn't, we weren't going to make it. She called me out on, I think God. And she said, all right, what's up? Something's going on. I need to know what's going on because this is, you're not, something's not right. Mm -hmm. So, and, uh, I ended up telling her, so thank God she came over and this was Thursday. This was a Thursday afternoon, Mm -hmm. Thursday day. And my next day to be at work was the following the next Monday. So she came over and, you know, I, I broke down and I I told her, I said, I've been trying as hard as I can. And I can't like, this is too strong. And I have gone through some rough times just that require you to be self-determined and persevere with just your strength as a person. Mm -hmm. So I put myself in water cuts for, for competitions where within 24 hours, I've lost 15 pounds of water. And what I did was sat nine hours in a hot, in a, in a tub as hot as I could withstand the water. So the whole time I thought I was, I've gone through some stuff that really you have to mentally push you mind over matter. And Mm -hmm. fentanyl was one of them that I couldn't, it took me to my knees. So I will thank, I will always, this is a friend who really helped save my life. Um, She has been in a situation where she has been through a detox program for alcohol. um, Mm -hmm. And that's when she laid on the table. I think this is what she needed. So, so we started looking, started looking through the computer and I started looking at my time frame. I'm like, well, I've got 72 hours to detox and this is when I can get back to work. Right. Um, so I did. Um, and I, I also didn't know what to expect in there. You know, she told me, she says, it's going to feel like you're in jail. Just be ready. Um, and it was those three days were the hardest three days of my life. Um, but I will always be so grateful and thankful for them you know, cause that's why I'm here. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously everything following, but the hardest phone call I've ever had to make. So I'll try and hold myself together with this one, um, was, was when I told my parents, you know, I, I called them and they, they do the, the evaluation. They, and you know, you go in, they evaluate you. They, you, you have to be honest, be honest. You know, if there's any, like anything that anyone can take from all these episodes that you do and everything is like, when you get into recovery and you start that journey, you have Mm -hmm. to be 100% honest with everything in your life where you're wasting your time in it. You're wasting your, your therapist time, your counselor's time. Like you need to be honest, you know? So, so anyways, I told them and yeah, it was like a movie, you know, like your mom was screaming, you know, I couldn't, you know, just out of terrified. She, she loves her kids so much that she was so scared of losing me. Yeah. But I promised them, I said, this is it though. Like, this is where I'm going to turn around my life. So spent three days in detox. Uh, very rough. <laughs> yeah. um, very rough. I, I slept maybe two hours during 72 hours because mm-hmm. you just can't sleep and you got to yeah. get through it though. So we got through detox and, um, you know, this puts us in January. So January 6th, I actually, I have a tattoo. <laughs> so, uh, that, it took me a while to think this is really something I want to put on my body, uh-huh. uh, but that's my detox date. So this is nice. January 6, 2022. And the reason I got that is because I want people to understand that they can't be afraid of what people are going to think of them either. Yeah. I want that to, to help signal, don't be afraid of who you are now. Like, that's who you were then. And that's a very big part of your life. You know, like people who everyone at your addicts who get through this, people like you yourself, you know, mm-hmm. but there's some of your strongest people around, you know, yeah. and to get yeah. through something as serious as fentanyl or, or whatever addiction it is, you go through years of addiction. It's very hard to change your life and rewire your brain. And yeah. So that is, that's where I got that, you know, cause there's so many people and it went through my mind during detox or, you know, I'm like, all right, this is really going to change my life. You know, this is, and, and I'm worried that it's going to change how people see me. You know, they're going to view me as an addict. They're going to view me as this druggie. Um, but you can't be afraid of that stuff. So if you're no. afraid of that stuff, you're not going to do it. 
And the longer you're sober, the the more and more that just fades into the distance and it becomes entirely a part of your story and just a part mm-hmm. of who you are. And then you become more of an advocate. So it's a lot easier. Mm-hmm. So like when I meet people, I'm just like, so what are you doing? When did you quit? Are you, yeah. you know, where, where you can just talk about it and people are like, whoa, <laughs> you know, because we're, we're yeah. good with going there. Like I'm going to oh, go yeah. there and I'm okay yep. with going there because, you yeah. You know, but I love what you said about honesty. You know, there's a thing in mm-hmm. AA where it says many of us do have the capacity to recover if we are brutally honest. Yeah. And we see people lose their lives because they're not honest. They're not honest yes. about their triggers. They're mm-hmm. not honest about their use. They're not honest about their vulnerability. It's 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 the biggest part of everything is really accepting our our weaknesses really right. when you think about right. it you know that right. we need help mm-hmm. and and that we can't do it by ourselves, and that this is a stumbling block and everybody's got their thing right. you know, everybody's right. got something right mm-hmm. and so for you it was fentanyl for me it was mm-hmm. alcohol and you mm-hmm. know dope and mm-hmm. I, you know what i'm saying some people it's anger some people right. it's it's you know just different things like everybody yeah. has something and i don't of think course. there's any shame in that but no. we have to be honest about it or we're not going to overcome it right Thanks for listening to the Recovery and Company podcast from the Life Change Center in Northern Nevada. We provide treatment for heroin, fentanyl, and prescription medication abuse. Please support us by listening on your favorite app and donating at thelifechangecenter.org.